Welcome to Kashmir Life Science Talks. As you know, we in this program we are talking to eminent scientists who have contributed immensely in understanding the universe we live in, different fields of science. Today we have requested Dr. Mir Faisal to talk about his research and the various theories he has written about in recent days. Just to help you understand that Dr. Mir Faisal is just not an ordinary young scientist. He has actually produced more than 160 uh, papers and falls in the 2% of the best researchers in the Stanford University's list that was that comes out almost every year and is updated on uh, almost a daily basis. Dr. Amir Faisal, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Just to help you understand Dr. Amir Faisal, he basically started with uh, engineering after doing his uh, bachelor's uh, at NIT Srinagar. Then he did his master's in particle physics from University of Durham in UK. He did his PhD from University of York, also again in UA, uh, UK and then a uh, postdoc from uh, Oxford. Currently, he is the scientific director to Canadian Quantum Research Center at Vernon. Dr. Sir, can we start this conversation by asking you that you belong to a medical family, but you chose engineering and you eventually moved into something that is more about space and time, I mean physics, and that too, quantum physics, mm -hmm. quite a new science. Well, yes, you know, uh, if I would say that science can be done at three levels. One is technology, applied sciences, that's where engineering and med medicine and other venture, uh, other similar sciences fall into. And then you have pure sciences, but pure sciences in the sense that you would analyze pure phenomena, but that is still at the level of some, uh, some understanding of applicability. And then there is a higher level to this, and that would be science for the sake of science, knowledge for the sake of knowledge and where you address fundamental questions about reality about the nature of the universe and these this is the kind of science i was interested in i started with engineering like everyone in in the valley there were social consider like social pressures and things of that sort and that is why i did engineering but my real interests were fundamental sciences sciences where you can address fundamental nature of space and time fundamental questions of reality and the nature of reality and that is that is my current uh, research interests. What I have heard about uh, you is very interesting that uh, you actually qualified to get into medical school, but eventually landed into an engineering college. Well, that was <laughs> I, 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 yeah, that was a part of a deal with my parents that to get into physics eventually. So I had to qualify so so I so as to leave it. <laughs> so the, uh, that was a part of the deal to get into physics that I had to go through. These uh, researchers and scientists, they have uh, their own. There is an uh, indexing going on about the contributions that scientists make. Uh, to the field of science in the diverse basket of science actually because science is too expanded now so there is uh, one uh, index called H index and uh, Dr. Faisal is at 39 and there is another index called I10 and on that he is at uh, number 105 so Dr. Faisal uh, let me ask you one thing that physics is all about the, the universe we, we are located we are placed uh, where has the science reached in understanding the nature in which we are, the universe, and what, what, what would be the new cold post? Well, that's interesting because you see, it, again, it's diverse, but uh, let's see what what, what branch of science addresses this fundamental question. That would be theoretical physics. And specifically in theoretical physics, when you would be asking that what is the fundamental nature of reality. Now, reality is in space and time, so it has to do with something with space and time space now we know ev every other field exists in space and time but space and time itself is described by general theory of relativity by gravity so the di the difference between other fields other forces and gravity is that other forces act in space and time gravity is space and time so you have to deal with gravity and by gravity i mean general theory of relativity or its modifications on one hand then we want to describe reality at different scales and if you want to go to very early on in the universe or at scales which become really interesting you have to describe gravity at very small distances uh, 
and you already know that at some very small distances quantum mechanics becomes important so you have to kind of work towards a merger of gravity with quantum mechanics it's more difficult than it seems like it, 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 I could tell you a trivial conceptual difficulty like you I won't call it trivial but a straightforward conceptual difficulty you can encounter think of a particle Classically, this particle can exist at a certain point. Quantum mechanically, well, you say we don't know about where this can exist. In fact, it may, it makes it does not even make sense about talking of a particle in this way that this particle exists here and it moves with a certain velocity. You, you have to talk probabilistically. So you can, but you can ascribe a probabilistic meaning to it. Like what is the probability of a particle existing in a certain place? It's still a well-defined concept. But quantum mechanics, now quant gravity descri uh, uh, describes the geometry of space and time. The idea is that spa time is a part of space according to spatial theory of relativity. According to general relativity, this whole space-time continuum curves. There's, it's not a flat geometry, it's a curved geometry. So there's a curvature of space and time. Gravity actually gives you the curvature of space and time. This basically means that time flows at a different rate on the floor of your room and then the roof of your room. And this gray gradient in the flow of time makes things fall down. <laughs> Which we can't see actually. Well, the gradient is too small, but too small. Uh, but but you're seeing it by things falling down. <laughs> That's how you're seeing it. You're seeing gravity, which is the curvature of space and time. But now think about it conceptually. You have a straight line. This is a geometry. You have a circle. This is a geometry. It, you can say that a particle can exist here and here. It's kind of makes conceptual meaning. I mean, it's not commonsensical, but you can see conceptually what it means. It means the particle exists here and here till you detect it. Now, what does it mean to say that a geometry is both a circle and a line at the same time till you detect it? You can see that the, <laughs> the question becomes highly non-trivial. This is at the conceptual level. Even mathematically, you see, mathematically, quantum like if you when you uh, when you are go when you want to describe forces that act in nature when you want to describe simple particles you can do that when quantum mechanics when you want to be more sophisticated and you want to say that we want to apply quantum mechanics not only to particles but to the forces acting between them and fundamental forces acting between them and we know <coughs> for example you could be talking of electromagnetic field force electro strong nuclear force weak nuclear force there's a there is a formalism to deal with this and it's called quantum field theories now when you try to analyze the forces using quantum field theories you get get infinity but then the nice part of this infinity is that there is a way to get away with these infinities and this process is called normalize renormalization so these interestingly both all these three theories electromagnetism uh, electromagnetic interaction weak and strong forces are uh, something called renormalizable theories so what are renormalizable theories they are theories where you can throw away this infinity in a nice technical way you can deal away you can uh, get rid of this infinity and get a finite sensible answer the problem with gravity is that even the even if you're if you even if you're taking now your geometry to be fixed and you're saying okay we'll just not go for this massive change in geometry from a line to a circle we'll just perturb the line a bit we'll just move the line a bit i'm giving you a one dimension anal analogy to a four dimensional geometry just for the audience to understand there you can this small perturbation you can still analyze in the language of quantum field theories and this small perturbation in geometry would act like something called a spin 2 particle a graviton that's what a graviton is a graviton is a small perturbation of gravitational field around a fixed geometry or a small perturbation in geometry around a fixed background you perturb it just a little bit and you take your fixed background to be fixed it can be a flat space time and just perturb it a bit even this does not really work because your, your quantum gravity is not a renormalizable theory. So you given mathematically you encounter difficulties there. So it's full, it's filled with difficulties. I, we could talk more and more about these difficulties. It's challenging. It's, it's very challenging. It is very challenging. I'll tell you something interesting about quantum gravity. Like this is the most naive interpretation to quantum gravity. There's, some, there's an equation. So, so, equa so the quantum mechanical equation describing the motion of any particle is called the Schrodinger's equation. It gives you the time 
time evolution of the wave function the wave function basically gives you the probable you you know if you know the wave function you can calculate the probability of a particle existing at a certain place this is in first quantized theories how this wave function changes in time is given by schrodinger's wave equation you try to write the schrodinger's wave equation for a gravitational field for einstein's action uh, you actually get so normal Schrodinger's equation is at psi, so something called a Hamiltonian x on psi gives you, time, you know, derivative with time or time translation times psi. You do it from for gravitational field, you have at psi equal to zero, so you have no time. So, so if you naively look at it, there is no time evolution, and this is called the problem of time. There are extremists, quantum gravity extremists like Julian Barber, who say there is no time in nature because if you take a literal understanding of the equations of quantum gravity, then they predict that time should not exist but time does exist so what is happening here where does time come from <laughs> you see the point like if you just look at the equations the naive simple equations of quantum gravity quantized gravity like any, any you know any other theory write a Schrodinger's wave equation for it uh, it's it's it basically tells you there should be no time but then why do we see time and it's a big mystery it's called the problem of time now i have written papers on how time could be emergent it need not be fundamental but it could be emergent you know you, you for example you could have like look at this table it's the, the geometry of this table is not fundamental i mean it's this table is not it doesn't have a geometry it is made up of a atoms with a complex system of interacting atoms which are also interacting with the molecules of air and there's a co and the atoms are not really mm, some solid structure they're made up of of, you know subatomic particles and which 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 is a very so it's a complex system but as an effective field theory at a lower energy scale you can describe a geometry for it and when you and in this geometry you can describe different aspects of this geometry so so my my whole approach to quantum gravity is that okay time might not be fine time, time possibly is not fundamental in fact not I would even use a stronger word than might time is not fundamental neither is space fundamental but it's emergent you mean to say that we have been uh, told in classrooms and beyond that the entire universe there are two things fundamental to it that space and time certainly not fundamental they are emergent i'll tell you a simple reason why they are not fundamental you have singularities singularities are points where uh, where a certain theory breaks down so if you calculate for example you know universe is expanding you go back in time it contracts it contracts and it contracts till you come to a point of big bang singularity at the beginning you have a singularity in the same way at the center of black holes there is a singularity and basically at this singularity any quantity you calculate any physical quantity either becomes zero or infinite but you know physically it makes no sense for a physical quantity to become in zero or infinite it just means that the effective field theory that you're using the low energy approximation that you're using breaks down at that stage at that stage i don't think uh, the and the reason why these singularities occur in my opinion and i think this would be an opinion shared by many people is that because because we are using the we are using general relativity and general relativity is a low energy approximation to quantum gravity it is at that point general relativity breaks down if i give you an, an analogy take a pen you 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 have hooke's law force is proportional to bending you apply more force it bends you apply more force it bends but when the pen breaks now if you're simulating this system you apply a small amount of force it will cause infinite amount of bending because the pen has broken there is no resistance anymore like nothing stopping it from moving in this ideal system and the reason why you would get a singularity there is because Hooke's law is not fundamental it's an emergent theory from atomic physics atomic physics is more fundamental so whenever you get singularities it does not mean that something really turns physics infinite it just means that the effective field theory that you were using is no is not good at that stage that approximation breaks you were using an approximation but now you come to a stage where that approximation does not hold so at the center of black holes and at the beginning of universe general theory of relativity comes classical general theory of relativity does not hold these and classical general theory of this relativity is a theory that describes the curvature of space and time that it describes the geometry of space and time so when it does not hold it it would imply that these points are not points which can be described by space and time so they are points they are physical points but they are not they are not they, are, they couldn't cannot be described in terms
terms of space and time they can be described in terms of a meta structure which generates space and time as a low energy approximation as a low you know some kind of approximation and at a certain scale that meta structure does not have a space time description Dr. Faisal before we get into the your actually the nitty gritty of your newer thing is the explanation of which you have hunted, discovered or uh, attempted to solve certain mysteries. Hey, can I ask you that uh, was this quantum physics part of your uh, doctoral research and post-doctoral post -doctoral research? What did you actually study and what you tried to understand then? Well, in my PhD, I did something called quantum field theory in curved space-time. So the idea is that, you see, you can have quantum field theories which describe, as I told you, quantum, you know, which could also describe perturbative gravity in some ways, but it fails when you try to do a full analysis because of gravity being non-renormalizable but basically it describes how forces act on uh, space-time now normally quantum field theory is worked on flat space-time but you can also have quantum or you can also you can also analyze quantum field theory on curved space-time so this is a semi-classical approximation to quantum gravity semi-classical in the sense that it's not purely classical and it's not purely quantum gravity your space-time is still is curved but still classical and the matter fields and other fields on that space time or including uh, small perturbations of that gravitational field are taken quantum mechanically so i and then you you use the standard formalism of quantum field theory which is normally studied in flat space and time space time to this curved space time so that is what i did in my phd i analyzed Young Mills theories, which are theories describing standard model particles, basically particles that can describe electromagnetic strong and weak interactions and even perturbative quantum gravity around a space time called de Sitter. Now, de Sitter space time is the space time of an expanding universe, expanding universe, if you like, at the very last end stages of expansion or during very early stages called inflation. At very early stages, there is a stage called inflation. So the geometry of the universe is described by some, uh, by a geometry called de Sitter space time. So I analyzed quantum field theories on de Sitter space time. It was interesting, but not super interesting. But in my postdocs, I started in my postdoctoral research. I started working on all kinds of things. I worked on M theory, which is um, we, like you have multi, you have many string theories, but all of them are thought to be some limits of a theory called M theory. So there was a theory of M two brains, multiple M two brains, just discovered by them. So I played around with it. Uh, it we did some nice work on M two brains ending on M five brains, and then I did something called third quantization, which I think was very interesting. This, this is a theory which gives a very elegant model for multiverse. So you have first quantization, <coughs> which is your quantum mechanics, where the number of particles are fixed, but you calculate the probability of these particles being at present in different places. And then you have your second quantized theories, where you can dynamically create and annihilate particles, but your underlying space and time is fixed. And then you have third quantization, where you can dynamically create and annihilate geometries. So you can dynamically create create and annihilate space time and this is this gives uh, this this gives rise you know the, you can you can analyze a, a model of multiverse in this um, model of third quantization where you dynamically create and annihilate space and time in this model of third quantization your reality your fundamental reality exists in a mathematical space <coughs> which is called the configuration conf configurational space of you know all those three geometries and then you play around with it and you uh, dynamically create uh, space and uh, you know dynamically create space and time I did some interesting work by generalizing third quantization to fourth quantization which is even more abstract so in third quantization you can dynamically create and annihilate a universe in fourth quantization you can dynamically create and annihilate a multiverse and then I <laughs> proposed this theory of multi multiverse <laughs> in that paper but yeah so that was that was towards the end of my po uh, postdoc but uh, what else I yeah so I did then I've been working on different aspects like I, 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 I worked on something called loop quantum gravity I worked on its third quantization. Since you talked about uh, universes and the multi-universes, the impression is that the, the, that uh, this uh, universe is actually expanding on every moment. Yes, it is. So, so are there parallel universes? Well, I will. I, 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 in fact, 
I would like to put it like what are parallel universes because a lot of parallel theories have been called parallel universes and I think it's important to distinguish between them. It's really important to distinguish between them. One of them is usually I'm you know I'm a parallelist when it comes for example to quantum gravity. I'm very sympathetic to string as well as loop. I, I accommodate different theories of quantum gravity but there are theories which I think are ridiculous and I would put it I, I would use the strong word as ridiculous and I pinpoint one theory specifically which is the many world interpretation to quantum mechanics so I think many world interpretation to quantum mechanics is a ridiculous theory it basically states that every time I do something the universe play or everything every time anything happens for example I lift this the universe has split into two universes in one of the universes I have lifted this in another universe I have not lifted this this is an absurd theory mm -hmm. it has absurd consequences if I try to extrapolate on this because a consequence of this is I should lift a gun and shoot my head and not be worried about it because I still live in one of the universes where the gun did not work <laughs> I don't think anybody takes it seriously, including the people who actually propose this theory. <laughs> this is like one of those theories where people know that it's so ridiculous. It sounds nice, but it's, it really doesn't work. It's the, so it's, you know, it's, there are theories which are so counterintuitive, but we know them to be real. This is one of those ridiculous theories where people even who propose what proponents of it know that it, it's, it, it's just absurd. It feels science fiction. It, it's not even science fiction. It's bad science fiction. So, so, uh, so this is many world interpretation to quantum mechanics I don't support this I would like co there, there are nicer and better uh, explanations to quantum mechanics like Copenhagen interpretation and then there's collapse models in which the wave function actually collapses and there is something called decoherence and these are contemporary models where people have uh, analyzed quantum mechanics and the major met problem of quantum mechanics in more sophisticated in more meaningful way and and they're even scientific in the sense that they're, they're, they're falsifiable so there are for example there's this model of, of objective collapse where the wave function actually collapses independently of an observer depending on a skill this is a this is a meaningful model of quantum mechanics but how you personally see it so i, I for personally i like the collapse models the collapse models are my favorite ones and decoherence would be my second favorite one but copenhagen would go collapse co close to collapse but anything but multi <laughs> many world but this is not the only model for multiverse that's the, that's the important take here there's another model for multiverse which comes from for example from string theory because string theory exists in 10 you know in string theory is only super strings are only consistent in 10 dimensions and m theory exists in 11 dimensions but we exist in four dimensions so where are the remaining seven dimensions of m theory so one explanation to where these seven dimensions are could be that our universe is a brain is a membrane in these higher dimensions so where, for where are these remaining so you know six six dimensions from a string or seven dimensions from m theory would be that our universe exists as a brain in this higher dimensional bulk and then there if you can have one brain you can have other brains now now this model is really nice because it's falsifiable because one of the predictions of this model is that uh, if these brains exist then the energy required to form many black holes is considerably reduced which can be formed in future accelerators we should have seen them in 2005 but then there are explanations to why we could not see them and the explanation could be that uh, explanations are uh, basically that um, certain quantum gravity effects might have stopped them but then they could be seen in future experiments but these are falsifiable models of quantum gravity and because another thing another prediction of these model mod these brain bulk models is that gravity can actually leave our brain other forces can't because other forces are described by something called uh, open strings with their two two open ends attached over universe if you like but gravitons are described by closed strings and they can actually leave our universe uh, into the uh, into the bulk so so then that might be the reason why gravity is so weak as compared to other forces but this is another model of multiverse there are other models of multiverse for example there is a model of multiverse which you propose in third quantized theories where your reality exists in this abstract mathematical configurational space and then you have multi universe universes created in them you can even have interaction interaction terms in this abstract configurational space where universes can interact with each other you can you can you can have similar things in fourth quantized theories you can have so basically there are many models of uh, parallel universe and there's just not one model of parallel universe 
many most of these models are physically sensible and they they can have falsifiable many of them can have falsify you know predictions that can be falsified the only model i would make an exception to is the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics these days we have a lot of debate within and outside social media about black holes because uh, certain things have happened in the universe that have been captured by certain telescopes uh, in the outer space and that has generated a lot of debate and maybe now we may have more science sci-fi uh, films coming from hollywood and other places but how do you see these black holes and how it can be better explained to people who are they meant to science? Well, let me tell you first simply what a black hole is. On a planet Earth, if you throw an object, it will come down. If you throw an object with a higher velocity, it will still come down. But if you throw an object with a critical velocity such that it can escape the gravitational field of Earth, it will not come down. It will just escape the gravitational field of Earth. Now, this velocity, this escape velocity depends on the gravitational field of a planet or a star or whatever body you are considering. Uh, if you try to shrink the body and you know the naively gravitational field depends on one by r square it reduces as uh, you know it becomes stronger as you collapse matter to a smaller and smaller space if you collapse it to a critical space like if you make gravitational field strong enough such that light cannot escape from it then this object is called a black hole but now this is the critical thing light is the mo is the fastest moving object in the universe if light can't escape from it nothing can escape from it at least classically and and so this so basically everything that goes in just gets blocked there <laughs> And you can't even know what's happening in because how would you extract information out of it? Classically, at least, if you try to extract it, you need to, you know, like, how do we see an object? We see it, the light gets reflected, we see it. But here, anything that goes in, goes in. Nothing comes out. So this object is called a black hole. Now, now there are very, there's some very interesting physics that goes on in black holes. I'll tell you some very simple results from black holes. Take a classical black hole. Take a spaceship going inside the black hole. Uh, at least in the most, and there are arguments for and against what happens at the horizon. But let's say at the most the naive level, start with a person who is going inside the black hole. In some amount of time, in a year, two year, finite amount of time, he will be inside the black hole. Nothing special there. He's moving in a ship towards an object. He will just cross there. He, this the, there's a surface of a black hole which is called the event horizon. Uh, where and this is the place for, for where the escape velocity equals the velocity of light so light doesn't escape from it he, in a finite amount of time he will cross this event horizon but for his friend who is sitting outside if he tries to measure how much time it will take him for 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 his friend who is going inside the black hole to cross the bla uh, black hole it he will actually find that it, it takes infinite amount of time for him to cross the black hole so for his friend who is sitting outside this friend will never cross the black hole he will just see him slowly approach the black hole and just gets slower and slower and slower and slower and slower and slower and for him to actually know actually if he actually calculates the amount of time taken by his friend to cross the black hole so this is infinite so for him he will never see his friend cross the black hole even if he waits at uh, like for all infinity whereas for or, or at infinity he will cross the black hole because it takes infinite amount of time to cross the black hole whereas for his friend he will have crossed the black hole in a finite amount of time this seems mind-bogglingly paradoxical but this is what calculations tell us <laughs> so you can see that there is something really non-trivial going on in black holes again I, as i told you classically nothing is emitted from a black hole but even if you do simple quantum field theory on curved space time then you see black holes are actually behaving like hot objects and they are, emi they are emitting a thermal radiation called Hawking radiation which was first discovered by Stephen Hawking and this is again strange why would black holes <laughs> like so so cl so classically nothing comes out quantum mechanically a radiation is emitted and it's uh, black holes are actually behaving as hot objects and the smaller they get the hotter they get and then they omit three things they omit their charge their electric charge their angular momentum and their mass is omitted like that is conserved uh, in the whole process of evaporation of a black hole but in universe there are other charges and other quantities and at least at a naive way it seems that they are you know those in that information is violated that information is lost and this has led to something called black hole information paradox now 
now we have we have strong indications to indicate that this might not be true but this is an active debate like there are people who have indicated that you know that there might not be the information might not be lost there are many re uh, resolutions to the, uh, there are many ways to resolve this par paradox one way is that the black hole thermodynamics fundamentally changes when the black hole becomes really small and that's something i worked on so you form a black hole remnant and the information is stored in the remnant uh, another is that it's stored in the correlation is somehow it's extracted from the Hawking radiation there are many many different way like way, ways to approach info like that is a whole discussion in itself we will need a full discussion on what different exactly. way exactly. different it's ways that technical. yeah it's, it's too technical, technical. let's not but, get but, into uh, that but the science for most of the people on earth comes through films and mass media mm -hmm. and mass media cannot explain the way uh, science it has to use the layman's language it has to use the stories and spacecrafts moving around so but uh, one of the fascinating aspects of science fiction has been teleportation is it possible I, I think yeah certainly theoretically you can quantum teleport states of one quantum state system to another um, so I don't see a I, I don't see a problem with why it would not be possible in real life but it technology there are technology I don't think there are fundamental theoretical hurdles to teleportation but there are technological hurdles we don't have technology for that but I don't see the why there why it would be theoretically difficult or impossible or even the, why why there would be any theoretical uh, hindrance to quantum teleportation. So certainly there. Not many people are uh, so fascinated by a time machine because it has been very popularized by the science fiction. Well, there is something called chronology protection conjecture so you can't form closed time like loops. So this is really important. So you can get. Uh, like you can uh, like there are strong indications to uh, like the uh, at least strong theorems to indicate that you can't form closed time like loops so you can't go and affect your own causal past if you you if you can go into if you, you even through if anyways if you ever do at least that's how i would think about it you can possibly go into the causal past of another object which is outside your causal wedge in some maybe through some ways but definitely not in your own causal past and you can't affect your own causality that would cr create all kinds of contradictions so I don't think you can form something called closed time like loops then a simple <laughs> not even a physicist and simple commonsensical thing that if you have if you could create time machines then humans would create time machines and we would see time travelers we have never seen and then that would create all kinds of problems you know because you would the time travelers would go to pass give them technology and then they would they would have an exponential growth and then then you would have you 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 know you 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 would not maintain the logical consistency of history I think the, you would get into all kinds of contra like problems <laughs> but you have something else which can happen which is called retro causality what can happen yes, is exactly. uh, yeah what can happen and this is something that can happen and this is not only can happen this is something that has been observed to happen is that you have to entangle particles you make you make a measurement of a particle in future but this future measurement affects the states of the particle in past so so normally causality works like cause leads to effect but in retro causality effect can produce effect can occur before the cause so the cause of the effect is in future and the effect is in present this can happen so there are conditions or there are like conditions for this to happen but this has been experimentally demonstrated to happen specific uh, uh, causal thing is called retro causality so retro causality is different so retro causality is not time travel because there is still two different particles you just make a measurement of one of the entangled particles in future that affects the entangled uh, particle in past so that 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 has been observed to happen so that essentially means that the debate is still raging that uh, future can impact past Future can impact past. No, there is no debate there. We have observed it. <laughs> so there is no question of debate. Some people uh, try to give interpretation, uh, inter uh, like try to interpret uh, it away like what has happened. But we have observed it. This is something experimentally observed. Future does affect past. Not can, does affect past. But not in a time, uh, you know, machine scenario. In the scenario that you take entangled particles, you make a measurement of one of those entangled particles in future. That affects one of the entangled pair in past. So that is how future can affect past. So it's not even can't future does affect pass in this specific scenario so retro causality it has been experimentally observed physics is at a very advanced stage but still we are too uh, small to understand the com uh, the complete processes that make universe and locate us in that but uh, a lot of things have been said and uh, done about big bang theory 
What do you see? How I'll tell you a very simple thing. Where like if you you, you we, one of the you know this is an observation observational fact that our universe is expanding. Mm. Take it back in time. It's contracting. You come to the beginning of the universe, you find a singularity. So there is, so this is uh, like there's no debate in that. The interesting thing is, as I told you, singularity is not physical. So what is the physical state of the universe there? That is something That is something I've been working on. That is something people have researched. There are many proposals to it. Though I think Hawking produced his famous no boundary proposal, where time time acts like a line at present but at big bang it acts like a circle so that is one one way he <coughs> and that's called a no boundary proposal no boundary doesn't mean that you don't have a boundary no boundary means that you know you replace like if you think of a line if you you know if time is like a line then it has a sharp boundary at big bang but if it acts like a circle then you have something called s4 it uh, an s4 geometry um, which is uh, which is like a four spear with three of three spheres of time uh, three spheres of space and one spear of time one like one of the dimensions of time were made into this uh, spear um, and that, that that does not have a boundary that's just one of the proposals uh, we did some really nice work uh, like i'll tell you one uh, about one of my works uh, there, there are strong indications from different approaches to quantum gravity from loop quantum gravity from string theory from various different approaches that space-time should have a minimal length to it and it should not be possible to measure geometry or define geometry beyond that minimum length so geometry possibly does not even exist beyond that minimum length space-time doesn't exist beyond that minimal length just this you know this idea this information we just input this information into cosmology and what we got was a very interesting kind of cosmology we got rid of big bang singularity and we modified the cosmology slightly more based on certain theoretical considerations we actually got an expanding universe which then which initially accelerates into expansion then deaccelerate then there is a contracting phase so we got four different phases of the universe so it's it's very interesting it expands and then it contracts back and then then you have a new you may some kind of a cyclic universe scenario so all these things are possible every time you one talks to a physicist he has explanation to a lot many phenomena but uh, one one thing I wanted to basically conclusion of this uh, conversation we do have a lot to discuss and hopefully we'll be discussing in coming days very soon but uh, one thing I wish to ask you is that you have done so many papers more than 170 papers and it is not 160 a, 160 <laughs> papers and it is not an it is not a small thing in in fact in in uh, most of the best in physics or in other fields two good papers makes a phd and it is not a small thing but uh, which paper and which uh, discovery or which kind of a new thing that had huge takeaways makes you satisfied about that the contribution that you made as i can tell you a few of my favorite papers that i wrote there was you see and this is the, this is the difficult this is a sad rather strange thing sometimes yes. I'll, I'll, i want to make this point like sometimes you do a routine calculation and it's very easy to get it published sometimes when it's a really novel idea it becomes really hard to publish it but one idea that i particularly liked was you know there was this Hawking Penrose's theorems based on some things an equation called Rai Chaudhary equation which demo, which actually demonstrated that any solution in general relativity should have a singularity so singularities are not mathematical artifacts they are inbuilt into the structure of general relativity we worked at quantum version of the, those theorems and showed that singularities would actually go away due to quantum effects and that I think was a really interesting paper um, we did certain nice like recent I'll tell you some nice uh, works recent recently recent like you, you know one of the fundamental assumptions in you about universe is that universe is isotropic it, um, uh, it, it, it it's the same in every direction um, uh, we challenge this what if it's not at very small scale and what could be the consequences of that and uh, maybe quantum gravity breaks isotropy so that was an interesting result yeah, there was some. I mean, uh, we discussed this result where, fu where fundamental. Yeah, this was interesting where we tried to resolve the problem of time using information theory, and there was some really nice work works on time crystals. We did some interesting works. I I do I, I do. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite works is my work on fourth quantization, yes. uh, where you know you have the first quantization as a theory of quantum mechanics, and in your second quantization, your particles are dynamically created. In your third quantization, your space time 
time is dynamically created but and in but, but then there's some structure which is retained there and in fourth quantization that structure is also dynamically created <laughs> so and then just like third quantization is a theory of multiverses fourth quantization is a theory of multi multiverses so in third quant just in just like in second quantization and you uh, quant uh, second quantized process studies the creation and annihilation of particles a th third quantized theory in a third quantized theory you study creation and annihilation of universes in a fourth quantized theory you would study creation and annihilation of multiverses in a very abstract setting so i found that to be really interesting yeah for all these years dr fazal you have been studying and understanding the, the universe we live in is there some kind of a force beyond gravity that keeps it intact and balance it and a disciplined force force beyond gravity in, in in the sense gravity is the curvature of space and time and gravity emerges from some quantum field theory of gravity it will some some quantum uh, theory of gravity not even field theory uh, sorry quantum field theory it would not be renormalizable some quantum theory of gravity uh, so there is so this is a structure beyond space and time it's definitely an emergent structure so something more fundamental than space and time would be information but what is more fundamental than information this goes beyond physics and this goes into philosophy and I would maybe next time we could have a nice discussion on that the hint is that it's already on net I've written about it but I wouldn't like maybe leave it so that I, we can have a proper yes. discussion on it it is related to Godel's theorems and I've just given four lectures with, uh, on this very aspect but we can leave this for the next discussion exactly. maybe exactly. but this exactly. is this uh, for the hint for the audience who are looking at it look at my work on or my talk on Gödel's theorem and information because see space time is not fundamental it comes from information like information can't, is an axiomatic structure and an axiomatic structure can't be self-contained and because of Gödel's theorem and actually you an axiomatic structure cannot you can't prove its own consistency in an axiomatic formal setting so what do you need it's something interesting we can discuss this so next Dr. time. So Dr. Fezzel has uh, <laughs> wants us to wait for the next session <laughs> he will explain certain things which are not explained ordinarily by the physicists or look at my four lectures because this is like four hour lectures that uh, which are available is so uh, which have just come out so you can google that but i would not like to put information that i cannot do justice to <laughs> exactly exactly so, so you watch it discussing nature discussing universe discussing physics outside the realm of science fiction so this is what it is and my face will tell you part of it and the rest you watch it. Dr. Faisal, so nice of you that you could spare so much of Pleasure. Time. It was a pleasure. Thanks Thank a you. lot. And Thank we'll you. be meeting again sure. because you promised uh, the audience that sure, we will definitely. talk again and again. Definitely. Thank Hopefully. you and so nice of you. Pleasure. So nice of you.